No, we're there. Here comes number two, the problem. <laughs> if the call of the gospel is that we would die to ourselves to come alive in Christ, that every piece of our lives would come into subjugation and submission to Christ, then this includes sex and sexuality, who we are made as sexual beings, the decisions we make by way of our sexuality, by way of our lifestyle, by way of our choices. These things, too, are not separate. It's amazing what uh, culture we are of, like, compartmentalized conscience, because honestly, we just don't want the two to collide, right? And I'm going to give you my testimony in a minute, and you'll get it. There's a backstory. So I say all this from a place of understanding. We don't want the two to collide. We're a generation of compartmentalized conscience. Faith, God, Christ, all of these things are over here. Sex, sexuality, me, my choices, in the darkness, behind closed doors, in front of a computer screen. Hey, I'm not hurting anybody else, am I? It's just my pleasure, my thing, my wants. All of this is over here. And we keep those somewhat compartmentalized, and we'd really like to rationalize that they don't touch. Yet we know the unbelievable conviction and weight when this is all off, because it inevitably bleeds into this being all off. We feel distant from God. We don't feel like we're hearing from God. We live in our shame and our guilt, or we're dehumanized, desensitized to anything of matter because we get what we want right when we want it, and life is all about us. And we compartmentalize these things until repercussion happens or the bad breakup happens that affects life here or the pregnancy happens or the abortion happens or the the addiction comes to the forefront or whatever it may be. And these two things suddenly collide. And what do we do? We blame God. All the hardship I'm going through right now. The weight of all of this stuff I'm messing with and dealing with. and, And God, if you were so good, why would you let this happen? We blame God when these two things collide because what's happened is that we've bought into what the world says about sex and sexuality. We bought into the taboo nature that's been wrapped around it. We have looked to a world and a culture that is twisted and cheapened and perverted and worshipped and idolized sex. They've made it a screaming match that their voices all get to be a part of, but it's taboo for the Christ followers to speak into. Sex is entertainment. Y'all, I can't even turn on a dog food commercial without it being over-sexualized. It's startling. Everything is sexualized. Everything is dehumanized because we see people as body parts made for our pleasure rather than image-bearing creations of God. The world has taken sex and there's the mantra of test test drive the car before you buy it. It's your body, it's your freedom, it's your want, it's your choices. The world has taken sex and said, run this maze, figure things out as you go. It's a touch and go, but kind of navigate it through college and what's everyone else doing and what were you exposed to and how does that impact you? And you put your naivety on display, your masculinity, your femininity, your sexuality. It's just fodder, right? And it's the same culture and world that's crying out, hashtag me too. I'm hurt, I'm wounded, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm I'm impacted so greatly by this. I thought it was my freedom, my wants, my ways, but apparently there's repercussions to all of these things. And so the same world inviting us into a reckless nature of sex and sexuality is the same world wounded by a reckless nature of sex and sexuality. And for just a moment, just the quickest glimpse ever, don't blink or you'll miss it. The world is looking to the church to say, do you have any hope? Do you have any answers? To the Christians, do you know a better way? Do you know healing? Do you know I'm falling apart? I'm losing it. What do you know? And they look at the church and we're silent. We don't know what to say. We don't know how to say it. We're silent because we weren't educated about it. We don't know what the word of God has to say about it. The conversations weren't had with us, or we're wounded. We've been hurt sexually. Or we misunderstand who God is in light of our sexual sin. Or we're carrying shame because we're actually living in the exact same sin struggles as the world. And we don't think we have any place to speak into it or talk about it. Y'all, if you want to lead, my goodness, we could take a 
peace, the topic of sex and sexuality, and you could lead for your whole life long in this arena by way of what our culture and our world is struggling with and looking to answers for, but they're looking to us. And we don't really want to say anything. God intended for us to shift a culture because we are look different, yet we're silent because we look just the same. But the truth, I don't know if we've ever heard it talked about in this language. Do we know that sex is God's intention? Made by God, for man, for woman. The first conversation God had with man involved sex. Well, I don't remember that. I just saw something about Leviticus about livestock and it made me uncomfortable. Yeah, things got weird back then. They still do. It's alarming. But the reality is that God's first conversation with man involved sex. Sex was actually God's invention. Sex is actually a gift from God, a unifying and powerful gift in the confines and the covenant of his design. It is a tangler of souls, and it is a weapon against the enemy. What does that mean? It means, I read an article one time, I talked about this couple who lost their their two-year-old, I think it was, or three-year-old, very unexpectedly, out of the blue. And they talked about the first thing they did when they got the news of this tragedy was they came together and they had sex. And I said, Carol, what? (laughs) I don't understand. And they talked about the fact that in that moment, it was potentially one of the most tragic moments of their lives. And they knew in that moment, they needed, number one, to remind each other, we are one flesh. We are unified in this. You are mine and I am yours in our most vulnerable, most broken, most exposed state. We are one. And they needed to remind God, thank you for this act of worship. Have we ever thought of sex in that way? Because it's what it is. In the context of God's design, a gift given by him that's never meant to be burdensome or bad or hard or painful, sex is an act of worship. Outside of his design, it's still an act of worship, but you're not worshiping God anymore. And there's only one other whom you're praising at the altar. That lands hard, but keep rolling with me. Okay, so they talked about we needed to remind God. Thank you for this gift. We are one. Remind each other. We will not soon be divided and put the enemy in his place to remember you don't get to steal, kill, or destroy this marriage, this family, through this adversity. They, they stuck a middle finger to the enemy, for lack of a better word, by saying, no, 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 no. This is hard. This is messy. This is broken. But we are one, and we will press forward. Sex is a weapon against the enemy. But outside of God's design, it is a sword he will steal from your hands swiftly and stab you with. It is a weapon forged against you. Sin. Oh, we don't like that word either. It's like very 2018. We don't really talk sin anymore. It's just like mistakes. Like I'm such a mistaker. I know, Stephanie. But we just make mistakes and then like we work really hard to be a good person. You're a sinner in desperate need of a savior. It's sin outside of the confines of God's design. And we would be wise to repent and turn back to God. 